because the Trump campaign channeled an ideological aesthetic that was far more inclusive. This might sound a little strange for those people who are uh, who are understanding that to be a center left in America to be Democrat is to be inclusive in a sort of human human resources sense. However, the Trump campaign. As you could see by the people that voted for them, it was a vast coalition of different people of different races and backgrounds, etc. Was far more inclusive in the sense that they appealed to a more universalist ideological aesthetic than Kamala is bright. Hello, everybody. This is Pascal from Neutrality Studies, and today I'm talking to my personal friend and former colleague at Tokyo's Waseda University. I've got with me Judith de Matagoda. Judith is a Scottish writer and academic studying modernist literature and critical theory. He now works at the University of Stuttgart and recently published an interesting article on the ideological aesthetic, the political as inevitable and epiphenomenal. In this piece, he and his co-author discuss politics, art, and inevitably, of course, fascism. The link between ideology and its representation in art is what we want to discuss today. So, Judith, welcome. Uh, thank you, Pascal, for having me. It's good to see you. Uh, it's very good, good see seeing you. Well. It's very Sorry, it's very good seeing you too. And, uh, you know, we've spent a lot of time in Tokyo and discussing and having our exchange. And I, you're one of the people I, whose inputs I always uh, value very much. So I want to discuss this particular article here with you. And maybe let's start with a quote that you put at the very beginning. You're saying there about, you're quoting Walter Benjamin, who says that, the logical result of fascism is the introduction of aesthetics into political life. All efforts to render politics aesthetic culminate in one thing, war. It seems to me that your entire essay is about this one quote, isn't it? Could you maybe expand on this a little bit and what, what kind of insights Walter generated here? Um, I, I don't think it's exactly about that. That's merely one facet. It is quite a sort of a, a dense and um, kind of complex uh, theory that we're proposing. However, I think uh, the the quote which you uh, read has a lot of relevance to what we're we're speaking about, which is the kind of uh, contemporary. Um, state wherein aesthetics and ideology have become to a very large extent intertwined to the extent perhaps that they're almost interchangeable terms. Um, so the ideological and the aesthetic are almost uh, equivalent and almost interchangeable within uh, contemporary art, literature, and more relevant perhaps to you within uh, news media and um, within social media, within the internet, et cetera. And these kind of like very interlinked spheres uh, have become very kind of seamless to some extent. And we kind of expand on myself and, and uh, our historian, Christos Somatos. <clears throat> the article wasn't that uh, recent. It was published in 2023, I guess, which is almost, uh, yes, a year ago now. So. Um, we expand on the kind of various expressions of this um, in contemporary art and literature and um, various other things. But can you give me an example for like where you think that ideological uh, ideology and aesthetics are now almost the same? Um, I think I, I really kind of noticed within the, the, the American election, which just passed, actually, um, I, I was really watching that with a lot of interest because um, once uh, Biden dropped out of the race and they replaced him with Kamala, um, and the way in which that campaign was kind of presented, um, it was almost entirely based upon an aesthetic, I guess. And I, I couldn't personally tell you what any of the policy features were, of that particular platform. And then the Trump 
campaign is already to some extent very much based on the ideological aesthetic, right? So that was a kind of given, but I found it incredibly interesting how there wasn't almost, you have a kind of American duopoly, right? Within this sort of two party system, that's, that's kind of given, but it's, this particular election I thought was incredibly interesting because it was, it, it almost kind of, obviously on, we're talking on a kind of unconscious societal level that the actual ideological content was completely uh, dispensed with and replaced with aesthetic content. For example, uh, Kamala's, uh, Kamala as brat. <laughs> <laughs> etc 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 so when we're talking about the aesthetic we're talking about the sort of like um sensibility which exists uh, within kind of online spheres as well we're talking about semiotic uh signals etc which are used in place of ideological content okay so instead of enumerating or uh expanding on specific policy and I'm not saying there wasn't any specific policy. Instead of emphasizing policy, they emphasized the kind of aesthetic, the ideological aesthetic, which is at the same time both ideological and aesthetic. And this particular campaign was significant for me in the sense that it was the first one in which the ideological aesthetic was, in my opinion, completely uh, at the forefront. I mean, a criticism that is often... Uh, voiced against, like, let's say, the campaign of uh, Kamala Harris is the focus on on um, race and and gender and so on. You know, on on su on on superficial uh, ways in which candidates present themselves as part of the black community, as part of of the the community of women, and therefore they evade a discussion about actual policy content. But what you're seeing is different. It's not just the the politics of 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 race and gender and so on it's actually the the presentation it's the way the the aesthetics of it works so the the imagery that comes out um i guess yes. what you what you're referring to can you give us more example of that uh i mean so i mean i haven't had the time to specifically kind of like um look at how the theory that i'm presenting like kind of applies exactly to this campaign. It's just something I noticed kind of recently. But um, I would say on a kind of, uh, on, on an instinctive level, how it apply it is when you talk about race and other sort of identity categories, those things are very kind of often subsumed into aesthetic categories and semiotic markers. Uh, and then these are used to appeal to potential voters. So, for example, if you, um, I mean, the, the Kamala is brat thing with using Charlie XCX as an album cover for her album Brat is a very good example, exactly. Because, like, you would only be familiar with what that even is if you're part of a kind of cosmopolitan uh, kind of, very queer coded, various sort of li uh, liberal sort of coastal American demographic, right? This is this. It's 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 almost impossible for you to be aware of what's going on unless you're part of that demographic. Now, by saying Kamala is brat and using the kind of uh, the font and the the <laughs> using the kind of like uh, aesthetics of that album cover you're almost saying far more than you would ever do by saying we're appealing to this specific voter, you must vote for us, and this is what you have to do. It's almost like a subliminal messaging to some extent. This is what I mean by the ideological aesthetic. I, I miss that. I actually don't know what it means, Kamala's ah. brat. I don't know what brat <laughs> refers to. <laughs> Uh, well, maybe you should edit in some some images or something. It, it's very interesting. Um, so, I mean, I, I don't actually know. I'm not a demographic here, but you very much are a demographic to some extent. Uh, but no, uh, it was an album released uh, in the summer called Brat by Charlie XCX, who's a, a British singer, I think. And uh, she has a huge following with the sort of young women and gay men etc uh and then the 
I think, I guess that part of the, the marketing campaign, they had a very distinct kind of lime green cover with uh, a sort of like pixelated writing that said Brad. And then there was a whole kind of marketing campaign in which this was, um, I don't know, it was, it was Brat Summer or something. <laughs> <laughs> and and she then, latched on to that. We, Kamala Harris latched on. No, no, no. And then that was already a thing. And that became a sort of like, you know, to the extent as it was intended by whatever publicists and PR company, it became a kind of hit amongst in social media. And then when Kamala assumed the nomination, uh, I think Charlie XCX tweeted out, Kamala is brat. And then they, they changed the kind of like cover with the writing and everything to see like Kamala HQ or something. And it's just like this, uh, it was wholesale absorbed, this one viral campaign for uh, a musician into a campaign for Kamala and Harris. Uh, that, that's, that's a very interesting, I mean, it, I feel kind of stupid talking about it to some extent because I'm not really that au courant with the details of it. But that, from my understanding, that's what occurred. And I think that was a very specific and very kind of interesting aspect of why why mean by the ideological aesthetic. And so, can we go further into the ideological aesthetic then? Um, to wh where is ideological aesthetic different from just public relations, from just good old propaganda of like trying to associate one one thing that you want to sell with an other thing that's already positively connotated. Um, how's ideological aesthetic different? Yeah, ideological. Okay, so I'm not I'm not speaking about something that generally speak. Uh, it's not it's not something that's really expressed on a conscious level. It's a kind of um, it's kind of mutated uh, social kind of phenomena, right? It's not something that's really necessarily intentional. And to kind of really understand what I mean, on a theoretical level, it might be kind of necessary to sort of examine some of the kind of philosophical, theoretical antecedents. I don't know whether your audience yeah, let's do would, that. Be, would be open to that. So I guess you would have to go back to the theory of ideology uh, presented by the French uh, Marxist philosopher Louis Althusser. Uh, now Althusser said that ideology is a representation of the imaginary relationship between an individual and their real conditions of existence. Uh, now, this seems, it seems to some extent quite complex, but also quite so reductive. However, when we look at the kind of terms which uh, go towards making this deficit, uh, definition, we have a representation, we have imaginary, and then we have real. Uh, and then we can see very much that we're in the sort of realm of Lacanian uh, psychoanalysis, um, the psychoanalytic system presented by Jacques Lacan. So what Althusser was saying was that uh, an individual's ideology is determined uh is, is a kind of unconscious relationship between uh his actual conditions of existence his kind of uh his id almost the imaginary kind of uh the imaginary kind of semiotic language that makes up the unconscious and what he perceives to be the real conditions of existence now um in order to understand this, I guess we have to kind of understand to some extent Lacan's model of the unconscious, which was a sort of evolution from the Freudian. So we have the id, the ego, and the superego, in which place Lacan presented the imaginary, the symbolic, and the real. So the, ima and the imaginary is very much the sort of id, the realm of kind of uh, undetermined and sort of... Uh, primordial images. We have the symbolic, which is the attempt to give some sort of structure and order to this kind of chaos which exists in the, within the id. And we have the real, which is the actuality which exists outside of the subjective individual unconscious. Now, an, um, ideology is a kind of mediating relationship in which there is an imaginary relationship between 
uh, the individual's kind of individual ego, his subjective ego, and his attempt to symbolize the real, uh, as it were. So I guess what uh, Althusser presented is something which is quite interesting because he presented art or the aesthetic sphere as a kind of ideological category par excellence to some extent. He said that art, what art makes us feel, uh, what, what, sorry, what art makes us see and, and gives us in the form of seeing or perceiving uh, and sort of feeling is the ideology from which it kind of is born, from which it kind of exists as art. So art is very much a kind of ideological category for Althusser as well. Yeah. Uh, so how is this relevant to what we're saying? Is is It's basically within the aesthetic sphere that one can really kind of begin to understand what uh, ideology is, what the sort of political is in a more specific sense, mm -hmm. I guess. And within the kind of, within the kind of intervention of technology, the notion of what is considered sort of artistic or aesthetic has become kind of subsumed into an everyday kind of discourse within social media, et cetera, right? Uh, so in this sense, one is already engaged in a kind of aesthetic construction of oneself, one ego, one's ego, one's projection of oneself onto the outside world. Uh, in a very kind of aesthetic sense. So we're already kind of conditioned to appreciate and apprehend the world aesthetically, as it were. And now my, uh, our theory of the ideological aesthetic is related to this, but also to the idea that we exist within a state of hyper-politicization, especially as a cause of the internet, as a cause of news media, etc. And due to this hyper-politicization, there's been a kind of paradoxical depoliticization of the kind of sphere, which is how of the actually politically existent extent. And then this has led to this notion of us devaluing both the aesthetic and the ideological and then kind of merging into one to some extent. Now, this is very kind of like... Uh, messy explanation but <laughs> maybe we could uh unpack it a little bit yeah it's very abstract i mean can we can we bring it back to things that we can can easily relate to i mean are you talking about things like the fact that on on twitter and and on all of these social media sites i mean youtube included we are now constantly bombarded and surrounded with political messaging and and political thought as well you know engaging in 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 this in in what's happening in the political sphere, and that this is then merged with with uh, artistic representations like cartoons that we see, or these before and after shots, like let's say of Gaza, right? Gaza before, Gaza after the bombing, and then suddenly you have you have actually an aesthetic coming out of that. Um, is this what you're referring to? Um, yes, I'm saying that when everything including uh, videos of atrocities and, you know, pictures of people's breakfast or lunch and everything it exists on a kind of aesthetic sphere because of the internet, because of social media, then this is the kind of denaturing process in which all of that becomes ideological hmm. through very specific processes, right? Um, so what... Um, What I meant by this process of uh, hyper-politicization leads to, leads to a state of depoliticization in the sense that when everything is political, nothing is political. And you mean political in the sense, again, of how people take pictures of their lunches, post them, and therefore they become a part of the entire, of, of a discussion of a group of people. And because everybody does that, then everything that everybody talks about is suddenly mm. is suddenly depoliticized in a way that it doesn't matter anymore. Uh, yes, um, I mean the, the 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 lunch thing is it may not seem at first interesting, but it is actually interesting, right? Uh, so we talk if we're talking about what 
Jean Baudrillard called about the 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 claim of subjecthood, right? The the sort of liberatory claim of subjecthood. It's this notion, and very kind of intimately tied to identity politics, in the sense that the individual is the kind of locus of and central facet of society, right? So if you're given a sort of liberating uh, concept of sort of subjecthood, like claim upon subjecthood, which allows you to sort of uh, construct, aesthetically construct one's sort of life and existence in such a kind of uh, minute and purportedly sort of interesting way, one is proposing that subjectivity is the kind of main locus of the social kind of dynamic. Uh, now, this has the kind of uh, cumulative effect of depoliticizing everything that exists outside of subjectivity to some extent, if you know what I mean, right? So this kind of mode of existence is to a large extent encouraged um, consciously, unconsciously, consciously to the extent that we have very kind of uh, purposeful engineering decisions which inculcate addiction to social media, inculcate the kind of uh, projection of one's ego or the sort of uh, use of a surrogate ego, the social media profile is <laughs> the kind of virtual existence one has is a kind of compensation for the actual existence one lives, right? So what I kind of mean by this is this, and this extends from one's, pictures of one's lunch to the projection of one's opinions on social media, right? I believe in this. I sign this petition. I post this black square, etc. right? Now, this putatively, seemingly hyper-politicized situation has the effect of depoliticizing the effects, the effic efficacity of those acts, Right. The black square in the wake of the BLM protest is a very good example, actually, I think. Because what, if you're posting a black square, you feel like you've done something, right? If you repost something, you've done something. But your act is uh, is contributing to a net depoliticization and rather an aestheticization of kind of status quo. It's a good example. Um, in in that sense, also like posting of Ukraine flags, Israel flags, um, like the emojis in people's profiles are are all part of this aesthetic uh, expression of depoliticization. In your sense, yes, for sure, for sure, I think so. Uh, and then this is kind of related on a kind of another level of complexity. Uh, we have we're we're living through a kind of mental health crisis, as it's kind of euphemistically kind of referred to, right? Uh, and I think uh, Jacques Lacan's definition uh, to to a very large extent of psychosis or the kind of initiation of the psychotic structure is the inability to differentiate between actuality and virtuality, right? So if you're constantly confronted with this quotidian situation in which you have to kind of bridge, you, you're, you're incapable of bridging the distance between who you actually are and what you actually post. So you have a virtual existence in which is kind of fairly idealized, in which you exist as a projection of your idealized ego. However, you know who you really are to some extent. <laughs> mm. So the gap between these two states of being, the virtual and the actual, and your kind of awareness of the disparity between them, between both of them is what kind of leads, in Lacan's view, and I agree with it to a very large extent, to a kind of uh, hysterical or kind of psychopathological state of being. Like as in as in <clears throat> actually hurtful for the individual, like as in a taking uh, schizophrenia between the online and the offline. Or I mean, I mean, we can we can possibly say it, it leads to schizophrenia, but I would say that uh, almost everyone exists on a kind of base level of mental disequilibrium, right? Because of 
social media, because of technology addiction, et cetera. <laughs> and I think uh, a concept like the ideological aesthetic is, is kind of um, interesting for, for understanding the kind of dynamics of that, I think. Um, yeah. Yeah, and is, I'm very, very interested in that because it seems to me to boil down again to this question of of public messaging and how to sell something. I mean, how to how to convince large masses of people of one or the other political idea. Um, is that a, is the, is it fair to say that? I mean, that aesthetics then is being used as a way to also sell ideology. Although, if I understand you correctly, you're thinking of aesthetics as an ideology, but um, the way that then that art then starts to be part of this everyday political process that political actors can use in order to shove ideas down the throats of the general public. Is that part of it or not? So, I mean, I guess you, uh, that's part of uh, the calculation, I guess, going back to Sigmund Freud's nephew, Edward Bernays, who wrote a book, basically invented the, the, the field of uh, public relations using his uh, uncle's psychoanalytic theories, etc. Um, he wrote a book called Propaganda, in which he kind of um, enumerated and expanded and explained the various ways in which one can kind of uh, control mass movements and crowds, etc. Um, however, what I'm speaking is is to some extent what 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 we're speaking about is to some extent a little bit more sophisticated, only in the sense that it kind of transcends the conscious, purposeful purposes, like a uh, purposeful intent of. Uh, governments and media and propagandists, etc. I would say that it's something that's uh, to a large extent uh, unconscious and it's difficult to even control. Uh, <laughs> it's, it, it more describes a kind of state of, of, of a kind of denatured public dis discourse which has resulted perhaps from this from this age of propaganda etc and the mechanisms mechanisms that were put in place for those um nefarious purposes i guess but what i'm talking about is more of a so unconscious process i guess uh, unconscious process in the individual or in in general in society in general like in let society me take, in general in let society me take an in general let me take an example from my own experience of this channel, right? When I make a video, I have this discussion that I'm having with you, and then I'll take a picture of you and I put it into a nice background and I put on there like words, right? That kind of have to represent on a thumbnail uh, in like five to six words what we are talking about or the message that I want to get across. And I cannot oppose that because the thumbnail is actually an important part of the entire of the entire enterprise. And even if I choose not to make a thumbnail, then YouTube will make one for me and will create an aesthetic, um, whether I agree with it or not. And that is something that just is baked into the system of how this medium uh, interacts with, with the viewer. Is, is that part of the ideological aesthetic? Uh, yes, I guess. But I mean, th those are also talking about, <laughs> I mean, everything, everything that's ideological, which is to some extent, everything, right? And everything which can be regarded within the aesthetic sphere. Again, we're talking about a, a few hundred years of art history, literary theory, etc., which has to some extent rendered everything permissible within what is the aesthetic sphere. All of those things are technically speaking uh, <laughs> within the kind of remit of the ideological aesthetic. However, I'm not really so much interested in this kind of like, on the kind of basic conscious level of advertising or PR or search engine optimization, et cetera, right? Okay, those are just one small facet of the much kind of larger phenomena, which, as I said, it's not really the result of conscious decisions. It could be, it could be. However, it's more, um, I, I would say, the result of unconscious social phenomena, which has come into existence because of the 
vast interconnectivity of the globalized world, I guess, and primarily the internet. Right, and what does it tell us in that case? If it's if it if there's no actor that that yield, wields it, but that we can just observe as facts of life, then the question is: once we observe these facts of life, what do they tell us about the society and about the moment of history that we are living in? Um. So I mean, perhaps I was kind of misrepresenting to some extent. But I guess there are people. There are people will attempt to. Uh, channel this right yeah. my proposition is that if we understand this phenomena much or on a more sophisticated level then it will allow us to gain to gain insight obviously but gain advantage as well i guess uh, much in the same way that Edward Bernays did. <laughs> they give me an example of the current of the current state. What what kind of advantage can we take out of this analysis when we now look at uh, you know the, the Trump and Harris campaign and where it leaves us in this limbo? Okay, yeah. Well, let, let's just take the example of the Trump Harris campaign, right? Okay, so I mean, Trump from the very beginning because he's a show he, he's a showbiz guy, he's a TV guy, right? He's a reality TV uh, showman, etc. That's his primary thing. He understood implicitly that the kind of aesthetic is the message, right? <laughs> this is why, I mean, the Trump hat to make the, the MAGA hat is an, an incredible sort of like, uh, <laughs> it's an incredible sort of like publicity move as a sort of aesthetic, as this kind of like, um, this very kind of simple sloganeering, uh, the kind of associations which he makes um and it's it's it is an incredible sort of aesthetic messaging campaign and it was almost impossible for them to counteract that with what they did now if they understood that because the trump campaign channeled an ideological aesthetic that was far more inclusive this might sound a little strange for those people who are uh who are understanding that to be a center left in america to be democrat is to be inclusive in a sort of human human resources sense however the trump campaign as you could see by the people that voted for them it was a vast coalition of different people of different races and backgrounds etc was far more inclusive in the sense that they appealed to a more universalist ideological aesthetic than kamala is bright which is a very strange kind of decision because it's like they didn't really attempt to appeal to anybody beyond their kind of base and a very specific part of their base as well. So um, I don't think either campaign really understood um, the ideological aesthetic on a particularly sophisticated level. However, as I said, we're we're in the realm of unconscious uh social societal processes and in this sense that they implicitly acknowledged that this was the most important thing because this was a campaign that was fought and lost within the realm of the ideological aesthetic as opposed to policy now that's quite a bold claim i guess this is quite a bold claim because you know if you go into actual substantive policy aspects, you would say it's an immigration election, obviously, right? No, but I, but I like this insight. I mean, this is uh, saying that Trump was actually had a more inclusive ideological aesthetic than um, does does kind of add another level of sense to what happened. Because also, if we think about the big pictures that we might still have in our heads, I mean, one of the most important ones is definitely Trump bleeding from his ear with his fist in the yeah. air to the yeah. backdrop of, so a, in, of a incredibly US iconic, Incredibly iconic image. Uh, you can, you can <laughs> really get a better one. As soon as I saw that, I knew he was going to win the election. That's what um, a lot of people said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, I mean, what I would say by inclusive is that, okay, in the sense that, like, I have no preference either way, because but I think that Trump, to some extent, is a very honest charlatan, right? In the sense that he doesn't really lie about how 
venal and corrupt he is as a representative of American plutocracy, whatever, right? There's no need to sort of um, have recourse to some sort of hypocrit hypocritical sort of like notions of like, you know, American justice, etc. right? And I think that this is what he displeased the kind of establishment to a large extent, because I think that the a lot of people need the kind of noble lie, I guess, Yeah. That there is a kind of like uh, inherent goodness to uh to what is on paper a very kind of like imperial predatory kind of discourse to some extent, right? Okay, so um on that level he was already universalist because I mean that's appealing to Americans to some extent, right? Because they 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 prefer people that are kind of straight shooters, right? Yeah. Like, I mean, Trump never lied about being corrupt. No, and Trump and <laughs> he Trump might have lied about a lot of other things, but he never lied about 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 that, right? Um, Trump Trump never tried to sell the idea that he could be anyone. He he, he that was not the message. The message was uh, anyone could be me. If we do, yeah. if we build the country correctly, and that's the American dream, right? You can be as rich as I am. You can be as famous as yeah. I am if we just yeah. do it right as yeah. as a country. So, uh, yeah, and he has a broad universal appeal because of that reason, I guess, right? Because I mean, um, I think a lot of people sort of aspire to those kind of like venal American ideals, right? <laughs> of like. <laughs> Of, of, yeah. of kind of bootstrapping and, and really not much care bordering on contempt for other people and, and, and that kind of sort of very harshly individualistic ideology. Now, that's the basis of it. How is that expressed is through the ideological aesthetic. It's through the Trump hat. It's like you anybody could wear the Trump hat. Anybody could wear the MAGA hat, you know? And, and anybody, then, you know, any, anybody can identify also with this with this idea of the nation. That's why the fl the American flag in the background yeah. of the picture was so yeah. powerful yeah, because yeah. that's of course the representation of everybody, exactly. right? Exactly. Um, um, whereas, I mean, Kamala Harris. Uh, first of all, I think very much a kind of like nondescript non-entity, um, and I don't think she really had to to begin with. She never really had any. So support <laughs> and kind of yeah. base of support for people that... and, and she inherited Biden Biden campaign, which was all built around not being Donald Trump. <laughs> so right. if you are built on not being something and the other one is good enough at building themselves as I am the nation or we are the nation, then well, <laughs> yeah. who's who's got the stronger arm? Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. So I mean, um, so, I mean, my kind of basic proposition is, right, and I'm coming from someone who uh, has a kind of putatively sort of Marxist left-wing perspective, is the idea that if you were to take the time to understand how this concept, this unconscious concept, the ideological aesthetic functions within contemporary society, then you have a very good chance of um taking advantage of it somehow well decoding decoding what's happening right and yeah maybe this is also the point where i want to ask you where does this leave us in 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 relation to fascism like you know donald trump and the trump campaign was often branded fascist uh the fascism itself as a phenomenon is something that um i think is anything but gone but and it, it keeps haunting the political discourse where does uh this form of ideological aesthetics interlink with fascism. Could you explain that? I mean, the, the use of this this quote, and shall I quote it? I'll read it out again. The logical result of fascism is the introduction of aesthetics into political life. All efforts to render politics aesthetic culminate in one thing, uh, war. Uh, so this is, I think, from the epilogue from Walter Benjamin's most famous essay, the uh, the work of art in the age of mechanical reproduction. Now, what's interesting for me, which I enumerate within this, uh, within the essay, which maybe you could give a link to, is that Walter Benjamin is someone who's associated with 
uh, the Marxist left-wing uh, section of the Frankfurt School. Uh, he died in very tragic circumstances towards the end of the Second World War. However, what's less known is that Walter Benjamin was very heavily uh, inspired and influenced by his older contemporary, Karl Schmidt, uh, who was the Nazi uh, jurist, legal theorist, uh, who is responsible for many kind of uh, interesting and sophisticated and perturbing political theories. For example, the notion of politics as being composed of the friend-enemy distinction, for example. Um, but what's more interesting is that uh, Benjamin was, to a large extent, uh, inspired in his own theories by Karl Schmitt's work on, for example, political romanticism. Now, Schmidt uh, proposed something very similar to this notion of the ideological aesthetic in the sense that since the Enlightenment, Schmidt saw that the romanticization of political discourse, the aestheticization, was what kind of led to many of the sort of conflicts which occurred in the 19th century up to the sort of 20th century, etc. This notion, uh, which is kind of left liberal, this idea of kind of um, emancipation, civilization, etc., derived from a very kind of literary aesthetic understanding, a romantic understanding, uh, which goes back to, uh, you know, the the, the, rom the romantic poets um, and in Germany and the UK, etc., who had both an aesthetic project and uh, a political project. In the case, you can see of Shelley and Byron, for example, within the British tradition and of various others within the German, etc. Uh, it wasn't very unusual for them to have both a kind of romantic aesthetic outlook. It was intimately connected to a romantic uh, political outlook. Now, what I was... So Benjamin's idea that the... the aestheticization of uh, the introduction of aesthetics into political life inevitably leads to fascism is something I tend to query. I think that to a large extent, this is kind of true. When st one starts to aestheticize one's own life, romanticize it to some extent, this is something that leads to the kind of like mythic undercurrents which support a kind of fascist worldview. I examine this quite uh, extensively in my book, which is kind of in, in uh, under review at the moment, which is about modernist fascist writers. Um, for example, uh, writers like Wyndham Lewis, Pierre Drulachel, Henri de Montalon, uh, Filippo Tommaso Marinetti, um, Julius Evola, all these kind of artists who were at one point associated with the kind of um, artistic avant-garde all of them fought in the First World War um, and were very kind of traumatized by this kind of first technological war and this kind of era of uh, accelerated technological process, which existed at the Fond de Siec, and then they eventually drifted towards the fascist ideology because of this, this the influence of the aestheticization of real life as a kind of antidote to the alienation inculcated by their own era of technological uh, progress, hyper-politicization, uh, etc. So what I'm beginning to query, and the reason I included that Benjamin quote, is that I think that Benjamin was to some extent, he knew what he was doing. Um, his invective was against the emerging kind of fascist writers like um, he viewed, for example, Ernst Jünger to be a part of that kind of emerging radical right uh, aesthetic uh, movement. However, his ideas were influenced equally by thinkers on the right wing, such as Carl Schmitt. And this idea that uh, the ideological aesthetic is only a fascist category, is only useful to fascists, I don't think is actually uh, true. I think it's actually something that's more universal. And if we have a more universal understanding of it, then I think then those of us that are not on the right <laughs> can have a kind of useful insights into not only the political present, but perhaps the political future as well. 
So when, if we take your notion or your understanding of the ideological aesthetic and apply it, um, what are the things that you would tell people to look out for? Where they see ideological aesthetic at work, like that that unconscious process of society, um, and and why that should worry them. Uh, so what I would generally, I think it's almost impossible to avoid it. If the only way to avoid it is to completely not engage in the internet and social media, which is obviously impossible, right? So, I mean, I would say that you really require some time away from social media, significant amount of time, or to kind of reduce your habits to the extent that maybe you get a dumb phone or something instead of having a smartphone for like a few months just to kind of decondition yourself to this kind of like relentless uh, barrage of uh, the ideological aesthetic in your kind of synapses in your brain. And then when you come back to it, you have a kind of more sophisticated understanding of it and you're also broken the habit of constantly scrolling for your phone, etc. And then you begin to see the kind of nuances of uh, the ideological aesthetic as it exists in different forms. And then you begin to kind of understand the effects it has, the comprehensive, comprehensive effects it has on uh, contemporary life. And if you could, if you could make a a policy prescription of how to make sure that the ideological aesthetic does not kind of get us into dark places when it comes to the political development of international relations, right? Of of how it how it whips us into war or into I mean this this is what what, what Benjamin war, warned us, right? That um too much of it right. will 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 result in war because it happens on all sides, right? What would be the political yeah. prescription to not let that happen? Um, antidote, antidote, an antidote. I mean, as I said, if you're able to understand it on a substantive level, to wield it, much like Edward Bernays, then <laughs> you could put it to whatever ends. You you you'd wish or desire, I guess, right? So I don't, as I said, I don't agree with Benjamin in the sense that I don't think the introduction of aesthetics into everyday life inevitably leads to war, um, because I mean, it's 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 uh, it's arguable whether this hasn't really been the case for a very long time. I guess we have been living in a state of war constantly for a very long time. Um, I don't think it's inevitable, though. I don't think it is inevitable at all. I mean, I guess ideally, the ideological and the aesthetic would be two separate spheres in which in which one could engage separately. However, I don't really see that as possible within the current technological sort of paradigm, I guess. So, I don't know. How does one avoid... Yeah, I don't know. You, I think a deeper understanding of the mechanisms allows us to kind of understand understand how things like war can be avoided. Yeah. And this is this is a very it's a very useful thing to think about, like where we where we encounter this this aesthetic that might also like drive us unconsciously into one or the other direction, and how this how did the entire social sphere is made out of such imagery. Um, Obviously, you are studying this, and if people want to follow you and want to find your writings, um, should they go to your Substack? Where should they? Should they go to Academia? Where should they find you? Sure, yeah, you could you could subscribe to my Substack, which is uh, free. Um, maybe you could put a link in the description. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, and um, if you're kind of, uh, <laughs> I don't. I write about uh, the ideological aesthetic in relation to uh, internet cultural phenomena, which I find kind of interesting, etc. But I also write about uh, literature more generally speaking. That's my kind of main uh, main area, main passion, I guess. Uh, and I also have a YouTube channel as well, which is dedicated to 
very kind of uh, slow and aleatory kind of random considerations of literature and mixing it with like scenic psychogeography, et cetera. I have a couple of videos on the, the Polish English writer, Joseph Conrad, uh, combined with me uh, walking around uh, the Bodensee area and uh, Zurich, et cetera. So <laughs> please follow my YouTube channel and subscribe to my Substack. Uh, Judith, thank you very much for your time today. Everybody follow him on Substack and, and YouTube. And we will talk again about the ideological aesthetics uh, once more information of it is out or once the, the opportunity arises. Judith, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you. Thanks.